Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth and final episode of our action project portion of the Trash Takes podcast. I am your host, Theo Aronstam, joined by Wesley Jang, Jacob Shia, Hajime Sano. We have Steve producing the whole shebang in the back, not to mention he's the cameraman on site. Um, Jerry is out quarantining once again, but uh, he does all the mixing and mastering in the back. And to wrap up our what season one, yes, yeah, we call one. it. Uh, we are joined by Dr. Judy Chu, who is the lecturer of human biology at Stanford, Harvard graduate, and author of the book "When Boys Become Boys" and co-editor of Adolescent Boys. And most importantly, if there's any expert in the field, it would be her. So, <laughs> how has everybody been doing? Um, we've been doing good. Um, yeah, how have you been, Dr. Chu? How has this? How has your week been? been? It's it's busy. Things are getting busy as we roll into finals and stuff for my students, but it's good. I'm good. Yeah, I think we can all at this table relate in some part to that, yeah. to the finals and stuff. But I mean, I mean, I'm sure you know it must be kind of different as I guess the teacher instead of the students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just preparing all your students for all the, the tests they got to take, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. All right. Um, any other updates that anyone else wants to share on on the table? We'll have all this talk about finals and stuff, but yeah, my weekend was very uneventful. I think uh, that's probably a product of that. Mm. Um, yeah, if you're noticing a common theme across all these check-ins, it's all it's it's been testing, testing, testing. This is the testing season, <laughs> and um, whatever weekend you have, there's probably some element of that testing in there. I uh, I actually had some variety this weekend. I went to KBBQ with my friends this oh, weekend. It was cool. Really awesome. Uh, they came home uh, back here. They're in college, but they came back home because their semester's over, right? So we had some KVQ. It was a great time, and it'll probably be like my last happy moment for the next two weeks <laughs> as I endure testing. But it's, it's, it was fun. I liked it. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so, Miss Chu, if you were to like describe how, like, I think um, just your work as a whole, like. Um, where that lecturing of human biology and subsequently like um, where that ties into um, like gender roles, like exploring different themes of like amongst boys and girls. Like I just like, I don't know, you maybe give us like a synopsis of like, I don't know, like I guess maybe, yeah, just what you kind of try to address and what you kind of, yeah. Um, so I guess in a in few words, my research has looked at boys' relational capabilities and strengths. So like what boys are capable of knowing and doing in their relationships, particularly because in our society and also in a lot of the academic literature, when I first started studying boys, there was a tendency to kind of underestimate and overlook what boys are capable of doing because you know relationships and emotions, those are always kind of gendered feminine. And so people kind of expect that girls and women are supposed to be good at this, but there really wasn't much conversation around what, you know, whether boys could do it or else it was kind of really kind of stereotypical assumptions about boys. Like, oh, they're not capable. They're not interested in relationships. And so it was really, um, really a, a, actually a harmful portrayal. Um, but to go back to a story that maybe you might find interesting is I actually started studying boys because boys themselves encouraged me to study boys. Um, When I was at Harvard um, for my doctorate, I was 22 years old and I had gone home for the summer after my first year there. And I was chauffeuring my 13 year old brother and his friends around. And they were like, oh, you know, Harvard, blah, blah, blah. You know, what are you learning there? And I said, well, one of the more interesting things I've learned is there's this woman named Carol Gilligan, who was a professor at Harvard, who had been studying adolescent girls and really educating people about, you know, what girls are going through and what it's like for them to come up against kind of feminine stereotypes and the whole ideal of a perfect girl or a nice girl and how those kinds of pressures were making it hard for girls to be kind of authentic in their relationships because they felt like, oh, they had to act or be a certain way and it was harder for them to connect. To other people. So anyway, I told these boys about this thing about girls, what were they going through during early adolescence. And one of the boys said to me, you know, that's all great and fine. And I understand that that's important. And there's all these clubs forming around girls and supporting girls in STEM, encouraging girls to, you know, have self-esteem and all these things. But you know what, there's stuff going on for boys too, and nobody's talking to boys. And so then he comes up with this idea. He goes, you know what, you should study boys. You can start with me. 
And so I went back to Harvard that fall and I was taking a clinical interviewing class. And I told my advisor, Carol Gilligan, that what this boy, 13 year old boy had said to me. And she goes, you know what, you should, you should go study him. You should go talk to him. And so that was the first kind of participant in my studies. I eventually studied, you know, over 200, interviewed over 200 adolescent boys, and then also studied boys at early childhood. But basically um, centering on, you know, again, just kind of revealing or um, revealing to, to the, not to the public, because I think anyone who knows a boy knows that those stereotypes are very limited and inaccurate, but basically making it explicit that, you know, here are these things that boys, boys can do, and we don't talk about it enough. And so trying to introduce that into the academic discourse. Mm-hmm. And I, we're all very appreciative of your work, because I mean, like, for sure, I mean, like, as I don't know, as a boy, I mean, we were talking to some, I don't know, I guess, female identifying guests the other day. And one of the things that um, you're mentioning is is like why boys were, I guess, hesitant to join, I guess, issues like, I don't know, um, yeah, issues like such as, you know, gender roles and like things like that. And um, one of the, I guess, points um, that I mentioned was that, you know, you know, oftentimes boys can feel like, you know, you know, we don't, we, we're not, you know, struggling from toxic masculinity. And we're not, um, I guess, really affected by its, I don't know, by its grass and stuff. But I feel like, and when in in response, somebody said, you know, you know, that's really, you know, not true. You know, everybody's affected by toxic masculinity. But I mean, I really feel like as a boy can oftentimes feel very isolating because, you know, we almost never talk about our emotions, you know, you know, between between other male identifying students. So I, I feel like, it, you know, as a, as a male identifying student, it can feel like very, I don't know, oftentimes it can feel like, you know, you're the only one, you know, with these issues. But really, in reality, that's not the case. Um, I can definitely agree, like just from personal experience, from experiences I've heard from some of my male identifying friends, just like holding in everything, not letting it show, you know, not letting it go outside, like all the hallmarks of being a, a strong a uh, tough guy, right? Um, it, it definitely, it definitely gnaws at you, uh, and and at some point, everybody breaks, right? So, uh, not not everyone can handle these this kind of stuff for forever. So it's important that we we talk about, it, we vocalize about it, right? So we, it's like it's like a it's like a pipe. It's like you can't just keep the pipe shut forever. You gotta let it you gotta let it burst out every once in a while. I think what was really interesting. I don't think I did. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but um, last year we had a course called Social Psych. Um, and this was, I think this was like um, exploring, yeah, the dynamics um, between men and women and how, yeah, just like how different stereotypes are, per- are perpetuated um, and how to build like good relationships among everybody. Um, and so when we were, you linked us those three articles and the first one, um, the one with Peggy Orenstein, we actually read that in our class last year. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I think it was really interesting, um, to see, I think it almost contrasted a little bit, um, but there was a lot of, I think just that first one, there was a lot of, um, they kind of noticed that just like that idea of like being socialized, um, in like isolated groups away from women and like saying like derogatory, like stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I think, um, I think. I don't necessarily know if I've noticed that in this community, but I feel like just like my kind of, I kind of inferred, I guess, in a sense that that kind of spanned farther and just like guys were probably just harboring like these different like viewpoints um, and just trying to like receive validity from one another. um, All like, just like whether that like, and just kind of like throwing morals to the wayside. funny that you mentioned that social psych class because I really do feel like that was the moment where I realized like oh shoot you know I'm I'm not the only one you know my classmates are sharing their experiences and you know I can relate to a lot of these and you know I'm not I'm not the only one with these problems and I think it's that's why it's you know it's it's so important that we gotta discuss about it because I mean if we don't discuss, we're alone. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a scary idea. Um, I don't know. Yeah, even it, it, 
we bring up the social class, social psych class. In the social psych class that I was in, I took it second semester, so I, I really only had half of a social psych class before it went virtual. I, I was noticing a, um, a a sort of hesitance for for male identifying students to come out and, and um, speak out and express their emotions. Like you know, when when we do the have move all the desks to the to the edges of the room and have everyone kind of share something more intimate than you'd usually share in a classroom. It was, I noticed that the, the majority of the time it, it was female identifying students that were, um, that were, that were sharing. Mm -hmm. And why do you suppose that is, Jacob? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I suppose that it is because of this, um, to toxic masculinity or, or, ma or masculinity as we, have a society have shaped it um, as a gender role. Um, something I I've been curious about is um, how much of masculinity is a is a gender role, um, and and how much of it is is biological. That's a great question. I remember you talked about this in episode one as well, and it's actually I think it's a really great question. I think that some of the things that um, get the myths that get perpetuated about the origins of these differences um, have yet to be dispelled. If, you know, for instance, you know, neuroscientists, brain scientists know for, for sure that if you look at the scan of a brain, you cannot tell if it's a female brain or a male brain. That, so that all those myths about there being a male brain versus a female brain, that's not, there's always going to be more variation within each group than between the groups. And so that's that, that's one of the things that really gets hyped up. Another um, piece of it is that the whole testosterone and hormonal theory, which there's a professor at um, Stanford named Robert Sapolsky who does you know work on this. And he says, actually, it's not that testosterone causes aggression, it's that aggression increases levels of testosterone. So the ones who dominate, that actually in drives that up. And so it's it kind of, um, gets misrepresented sometimes. And then also, um, you know, as, as actually Wesley pointed out in that episode, that if it were nature, then there would be a lot more similarity across individuals, but you see a lot of variation, right? There, yeah, there are maybe some guys who are more domineering and more aggressive, but then there's also guys who are not. And so, you know, if it were all inherent, um, we'd see a lot more kind of, there wouldn't be as much variation or individual differences. Um, and the other thing too, is if it was all inherent, then why do we need to police it so fiercely? Like if this is just how, you know, guys were meant to be, then why do we have so many structures and practices in our society that shame boys who step outside of those, those, you know, kind of strict, narrow, um, as Theo called them, really narrow definitions of masculinity that can almost feel like straight jackets sometimes because they really do impinge on the realization and expression of a full range of your humanity, right? So a lot of the things that we do, I mean, when, when, uh, really nice way of describing it is Terry Real, who's a couples therapist in Boston, talks about it. He says, when you take the whole range of human qualities and interests and everything, and you divide that in half, and you say one half is masculine and the other half is feminine, and only boys and men can be masculine, and only girls and women can be feminine, then everyone loses because everyone has to cut themselves off from a part of what, what is essential to their humanity, right? And so when you talk about, I actually, I can understand the utility of the word toxic masculinity, but I actually don't like to use it because I don't think it's accurate. And I think it's a slippery slope to kind of saying boys and men are toxic or anyone who's masculine is toxic. Although I think that you've really described it in an accurate way, which is to say there are aspects, for instance, violence and aggression and all those things, aspects of masculinity that can be very harmful. But I usually, if we have to use toxic, I prefer to say that it's toxic patriarchy and that patriarchy sucks for everyone. It's obviously bad for women and girls and non-binary folks, but it is also harmful to boys and men's health. And that's one of the things that my, I do with my work is I work with a foundation called Movember. And they found, you know, and, and plus there's lots and lots of studies that show that, you know, conventions of masculinity that emphasize, you know, toughness and stoicism and self projected self-sufficiency, that those, are bad for men's physical health as well as their mental well-being. 
And to go on um, Hajime's point about mental health, I think it's really great that you talk about, you know, how you normalized, you know, mental health issues. Because I think, again, a kind of myth or misconception in our society is we say, oh, well, there are people who, there are the individuals who need help or assistance with this, and then they're the ones who don't. And that's not accurate at all. Everyone needs help sometimes. If you're going through a difficult situation, you're going to need help, right? And so to make that restrictive or, or specific to one gender or, or another is not helpful because we all need help sometimes. And so just thinking about what do we cut people off from, not in terms of their humanity, but also in terms of you know, their ability to ask for help when they need it, when we abide by these really archaic and really you know, kind of out of date and really un the gender norms that were constructed, you know, that are largely socially constructed and imposed upon us. Uh, yeah, I actually listening to uh, listening to you talk about how it's harmful for not just guys but girls, right? But uh, earlier you also said that there are lots of systems in place designed to 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 uh, force boys down this uh, path of, like we said, narrow uh, definition of masculinity, right? Why? That 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 seems like a paradox, right? If it's if it's bad for everyone, then why does everyone seem to want to enforce it? Uh, I wanted to ask your guys' thoughts on that because that 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 just seems really backward to me, right? If you really think about it, if you, if you just lay it out, it wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, right? Wait, I think that my I think I think that kind of concept of if one person is privileged, all of people will if one person is privileged over another class, that all people will suffer. I kind of feel like I mean, I don't necessarily know it's a fundamental truth, but um, I feel like when you're like a when you, even if you're in like the like wealthy upper class, but you have to like or you could be like a like a millionaire or like a billionaire or whatever. Um, I feel like even in that instance, you have to, you're like so worked up and just like trying to make like business moves and stuff that, that, um, that inherits that you are like privileged in a sense. Like you're still like, I feel like there's still like anxiousness, especially I feel like there's been like revelations of like people like trying to like, yeah, you know, like the, the sentiment eat the rich. Um, I mean, I don't know what, to what extent, like, I guess rich people are like, um, discombobulated but i feel like i feel like is i don't i'm not i guess i wouldn't infer that up there there would be like in a whole sense of like tranquility um so i feel like just that um yeah i feel like people that are privileged in that sense i feel like there's probably disparity and like um anxiousness and just like um despair across the board i feel like yeah that kind of goes back to um, Hajima's question, um, w w like why we, we've embraced the system that, that really damages everyone. It, it's I think it's because the people, like pe people, don't recognize that it's damaging. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Similar lines can be drawn to social or um, economic inequality, um, not 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 so much to, to that extent, um, because because I believe that that people who are wealthy um, are, are at least somewhat aware. Of, of economic inequality, but um, this the system of patriarchy is something that we've been with for for so long since almost like the beginning of, of recorded civilization. Almost, um, it, we've just been with it for so long that people don't recognize it as a harm; they recognize it as, as a norm. Uh, it's like that. Um, I totally agree with Jacob. Right? Uh, it made me it made me uh, think about. Um, there's there's a how do I call this? It's like a it's like a metaphor. I don't know. It's it's about um how if you place a frog in boiling hot water, it will instantly jump out because it's hot, right? It's got to jump out. It's gonna it's gonna boil to death. But if you place a frog in like lukewarm water and slowly turn it up, it's not gonna jump out, even if it gets too hot to the point where the frog's probably gonna die. It's not gonna jump out because it doesn't realize that it's gotten too hot for it to survive there, right? I think uh, that might be the case with um with uh, generals and uh, to the toxic patriarchy that we're talking about. Maybe um, in the in the beginning, it was more benign. Like, as you said, the beginning of civilization, it was a much more benign idea. But as time has gone on, it's gone, uh, it's gone worse and worse. And people just haven't realized that it's gotten worse and worse. Yeah, and I guess just I, now that you guys are saying that, you know, it's making me think about how, you know, the actual, I guess, gender roles themselves might actually 
play into that? Because I mean, like, obviously with um, traditionally male, I guess, gender roles, it's you're taught to, you know, tough it out, you know, push through, you know. So, I mean, maybe that could cause you to, I guess, ignore some of these, I don't know, some of these, I guess, detrimental things, such as detrimental things. And on the other hand, I mean, I guess traditionally feminine gender roles are say, you know, you should be, you know, you know, be polite, you know, don't make waves and stuff. And perhaps, you know, that could also, you know, I guess, push you to, I guess, not speak out about these, how, I guess, these roles have been affecting you. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I think, um, for me, um, kind of adding on back to, like, the concept of, like, not noticing when it's, like, toxic and stuff. I think what's really interesting, like, the d- dynamic with me and Wesley, we've been friends since, like, fourth grade, but it's never been, like, we could create open dialogue about, like, this type of stuff. Uh, I think, especially in middle school, um, the dynamic would be, like, I would dictate, like, the, so, like, the, like, what was going on in the group, and that would oftentimes be, like, jokes, jokes that were, like, towing the line of, like, I don't know, like, offensiveness and stuff. And it was all, I was all because I sort of thought that would, that was the standard of camaraderie. Um, and Wesley, on the other hand, um, you were like, I don't know, what, what would you, how would you describe yourself? Uh, like in middle school? Yeah. Um, just a shy, quiet type, you know, you know, it's, it's kind of funny now that I, I think about it. I mean, like a lot of the, I guess, traits that I picked up on are actually kind of like stereotypically feminine gender roles. I think that could par- partly play into my, I guess, Asian American identity, maybe in a little little bit. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't know. It's just kind of like a quieter, you know. I let, I let Theo take the, the helm. Yeah, <laughs> which was not a good idea because I never really employed a sense of like, like just like trying to like be open and stuff. Um, and I was just, I was just, like, I was perpetuating a cycle of toxicity. But I think in that same sense, I noticed that I wasn't, this wasn't bringing me like joy or happiness. I was, I think I was noti- noticing in a capacity, like maybe you weren't enjoying it to the fullest extent. Um, and I think as I, I think, um, as I kind of grew older uh, or like, as I kind of grew, um, I just like, I kind of, uh, I don't know. I just was like, why am I like holding my sense of like humor or like my like sense to be funny in such like a high regard when the result is it's just like hurt. Like it has the potential to hurt a bunch of people. Um, and I'm like, yeah. And it's just like, um, and so I think what I try to employ like when I started my freshman year was like trying to employ just like to speak my own voice and my own truth because I was making observations about this thing, like stuff like this, but I was never felt like the ability to like fully vocalize it. Um, and so um, as our friend group kind of shifted, I think then I, I, I think then it became like the, the unfortunate truth of the beginning was like, I was instilling an un, like unfair play f- playing field, but now I feel like I feel like there's just like a better sense of openness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess um, my next question for you, Miss Doctor Chu, um, would be uh, kind of going back to that idea of like. Um, that these like gender roles are like detrimental for everybody involved. Like, um, or I guess my next question would be like, um, just that con, I think what was really interesting when you were touching about like that, that taught that concept of toxic masculinity, like perpetuating the idea that like, like toxic masculinity can be like detrimental because it like almost denounces, um, masculine traits. So I guess my next question would be like, what do you think? What do you think a lot of people should do? Have a better idea, like understanding about, like, um, well, we kind of touched on that a little bit. We well, she, uh, Ms. Dr. Chu, kind of touched on the idea of like how what people should understand better. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I thought that the question that you all raised was really good about, like, you know, about why do people conform to this. You know, and one of the, you know, Hatumi pointed out that, you know, he's kind of like turning up the heat slowly with, the, you know, the frog. But the thing is, your generation recognizes that these are bad things. You have this whole term, toxic masculinity. You know it's a bad thing. 
and you're already actively challenging it and saying, you know, we don't want this, right? This is what I'm hearing in my students at Stanford as well. We don't want this, but then, so what's holding, what's making it difficult for us to actually replace it? Like, why is it still here? Like, we know that it's outdated. We know it's not good. We don't like it. What's holding us to place? And so one of the things to kind of consider is, you know, what is what is the motivation for confirming, right? What are the reasons why? Because people, you know, there are reasons why people behave and, you know, act and do the things they do, right? And so what I found in my research was that what motivates the boys, it's not like some sort of like rule. It's not like some sort of abstract desire to prove their masculinity, that they therefore conform to masculinity. It's, it's, it's not about, especially among four and five-year-old boys. And you, you bring this up. I like, Theo, what you said about the standard of camaraderie, right? Because what I found with the boys was that what was driving everything was just their desire to fit in and to belong and to connect with their peers, right? So, and so you're reading and, and, and boys are very astute and very perceptive and they're reading the situation and they're saying, you know, what's it going to take for me to be one of the boys and with the boys? You know, how do I make friends? What what are people going to like? What's going to make people like me and think I have, you know, value? And so, and then what, you know, and they're, like I said, they're reading, they're reading the messages. They're maybe feeling some of the pressures. Sometimes the messages are explicit, like, you know, boys don't cry or boys are supposed to like sports or whatever the messages are hearing. And they're really working to kind of accommodate themselves or to conform to those because they want people to feel that they're, attractive and desirable and and they want people to be friends with them and so that's really kind of at the heart of it is this desire for connection we want to we want to connect to other people and so that's one of the things that locks it in place because there's it um until you know more discussions like yours happen where people feel like gosh first of all like what you were saying earlier everyone is made in this society there's a tendency that what creates the pressure around socialization is the tendency to make people feel like you're the only one who's struggling you're the only one who has a problem with these notions. Everyone is doing fine. Everyone else. So it's just, um, you probably learned about this in your social psych class, this concept of pluralistic ignorance, which is kind of like the, the emperor has no clothes, right? It's just like, oh, I think that everyone else is fine with it. I'm the only one, so I shouldn't say anything. But then once you start talking, and this is why these discussions are so valuable and important, once you start talking, you realize, oh, that person uh, you know, sees it the same way I do. And so it's, that moves us away from this individual is problematic because they don't fit in to, hey, the expectations that we have maybe are problematic. And maybe it's not the individuals who say this, you know, I don't like this toxic masculinity. Maybe the masculinity is a problem or maybe the, you know, the assumptions and expectations that we have for, for boys are not ideal. And in fact, you know, Joe Pleck in his book, The Myth of Masculinity, which was written in 1981. So it, they've been saying this for years. He said, you know, these ideals of masculinity are ultimately unattainable, right? Nobody can be tough and stoic and self-sufficient all the time. We all need people. And so it sets up boys and men to strive towards an ideal of masculinity in relation to which they will inevitably fall short because nobody can be all those things all the time. And at any point, someone can call you out. Oh, you wore a pink shirt or, oh, you, you love your mother or whatever. And that's suddenly, you know, emasculating, right? And so... It sets up a precarious, first of all, masculinity is precarious, but it also sets boys and men to feel like they are always falling short in light of this ideal, and then they feel insecure about it, right? And so, and, and if you add to that, that whole motivation of they just want people, they want to feel valued, they want to feel worthy, and yet they feel like by societal standards, maybe they're not going to, you know, there's a shame involved with like, oh, somehow I'm not meeting those expectations, that that can get in the way of really challenging what seems to be what everyone else is doing and what everyone else seems to be comfortable with. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I, I think that's definitely, that's like, I, I think I've observed that definitely. Um, and I think for me, I've since I've, I think I've kind of been in this, I don't know necessarily, if it's, but I've been in the system of Piedmont. Um, and, but I feel like um, maybe I'm like ignorant in that kind of vacuum almost, because like, I feel like a lot of the times that I, cause I was just employing humor, dictating what the humor was may like, I think for me, um, sometimes maybe I wasn't understanding what maybe the other like side of like, or like other people who were my friends, like they were just trying to fit in. Um, and, uh, yeah. And it's like, 
I think I I don't know. I think I think I guess I per- especially when I was a lot younger, I perpetuated that kind of idea, especially in middle school, um, that the camaraderie stems um, like it doesn't stem f- like the com- I guess the camaraderie that I created with my friends didn't stem from um, real like talking about issues that were pressing and that were hurting everybody, but rather I guess. Um, more what I observed is like I, what I observe now as toxicity. Um, yeah. Hmm. It's I think not that... necessary to judge it either. I'm sorry. I, it doesn't have to always be good or bad. Sometimes you can just be hanging out and you can just be messing around and just be figuring stuff out and to give everyone space to make mistakes. And we all do, you know, foolish things when we're young. And I mean, and don't, please don't misunderstand like when I when that term pluralistic ignorance doesn't mean that you're ignorant it just means that you know if you were to personify patriarchy what's the best way for patriarchy to make sure it gets perpetuated right to make sure it continues and no one challenges it is to make everyone who has a problem with it or to, who, who questions it to feel like they're the only one that's questioning it right and so that it purposely separates us it keeps it misleads us into ignorance but it doesn't mean that you're ignorant and there's plenty of evidence in the evidence you know in the studies of boys and in studies of girls that individuals they exhibit a healthy resistance against that. I mean, even the really young kids, nobody likes to be told what to do and what to think. They'll say, you're not the boss of me, right? And nobody, you know, and we, so that that's a healthy resistance because that's a resistance in, in a, that serves to preserve your sense of integrity, your sense of wholeness and authenticity. And we are born and built for connection and that rests on our ability to be real in our relationships. We, you know, we have total... BS detectors. We know when somebody else is not being truthful to us, like when they're like obviously mad and you ask them what's wrong and they're like nothing. Right. And so anyway, I don't mean to dominate your conversation, but I just wanted to point that didn't want to, it to come across like I was saying that anyone in particular was ignorant. It's just that this perpetuation of keeping people in the dark so that they don't realize that actually the problem is with the system and with the societal norms and not with the individual who can't meet those, you know, those ideals. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I think this is probably pretty correlated, but yeah, one of the as you say that it, it's uh, making me think of one of the um, the articles you shared with us. Um, it was specifically like the, the Time article. I forget the name of it, but it had the video portion about the silence breakers, and yeah, that whole thing was about how you know individually. I guess the I guess. I guess, um, female identifying people who were, I guess, survivors of these instances of sexual assault were kind of like, you know, I guess, scared to come out because they were scared that they were going to be silenced by, I guess, the larger bodies that were, I guess, I guess, almost like the patriarchy. And um, I suppose that, you know, I think one of the things I heard from it, it was like, you know, I, I, it's not going to be an exact quote because I don't have my notes right in front of me, but it was like somebody said, like, I felt like I had to be brave for the for the other for the others, you know, and it's yeah, the whole concept about, you know, I guess speaking out and showing that, you know, it's not just it's not just you who's the who's who's the problem. It's never been you who's been the problem. It's I guess everything. Yeah, I guess the system that that's I guess you're I, I guess existing it. Um, I don't know. Uh, Jacob, were you going to say something? or? Well, no, earlier I was just going to say that um, um, Dr. Chu earlier mentioned that um, there's, this, the, there's this ideal that, um, that men were, um, that they're, they're insecure due to the fact that they, they never will truly reach that ideal. Um, and I think that the, the same logic, I, me not being a female identifying individual, I, I won't be able to speak directly to this, but um, that that could be the the same situation for for female identifying um, individuals as well, um, and that I guess is is a is a point in favor of the of the notion that um, uh, men and women their their brains psychologically um, ha- have that similarity. Mm-hmm. 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 But I think one of the things, and this is um, something that you kind of started to hint at in the last episode, 
is that it's not just two separate and equal tanks, masculinity and femininity, right? Because then that would be like, okay, well, everyone's held to expectations. And that is absolutely true. But in our society, we much more place much more value on masculinity than on femininity. So when a when a girl is a tomboy, right, she's moving or when a woman be, goes into a profession that's, you know, historically male dominated, that's moving up. And you, you had mentioned like, you know, but on the other hand, like if, if a man goes into something like care work, that's historically gendered feminine and female dominated or teaching or caring for children or anything like that, that's seen as a downgrade. Right. And so that impacts like what, how it plays out in, in a sense. And so, and the other thing is because masculinity has holds greater status and value that when men deviate or when, you know, when they deviate from that, they're more harshly punished. And, and the fact that you have to prove it, like you, you don't hear it as much. I mean, obviously women can be shamed for not being feminine enough, but it's not quite to the intensity that boys are shamed. Like, so again, to use that example of tomboy, when you say a girl's a tomboy, these days it's practically a compliment, right? It means that she can take it, you know, as well as the boys can, she can do whatever the guys can do. But if you call a guy a sissy, it's not, you, you know, it still pretty ha carries negative connotations. And so to really think about that, like if we're looking at towards moving towards gender equality, we can't just say, oh, well, let's give everybody access to be more masculine. You actually, actually also need to raise the value of things we've gendered feminine and to make that more accessible. Because there are a lot of young men, you know, aspire to be, for instance, good fathers, you know, or good friends. And in order to do that, they have to have permission to care. And right now, the way that we construct masculinity, that makes it really hard. And so you have these boys and men who naturally do care. Obviously, they care about the people that they love. They care about their friends and their families and everything. But to express it somehow becomes associated with, it becomes a liability. It becomes a weakness because that's how the masculinity, you know, the binary, the gender binary defines masculinity as the opposite of femininity. So you're not supposed to show any of that. And it makes it harder for men and boys to access that and to value those things in themselves. Uh, I kind of want to go on a little spiel about the uh, masculine traits and the feminine traits thing. I really don't like that they're they're separated like that. I think both of those things are just things that make us human, right? They're not like one side is only for boys, one side is only for girls, and if you deviate from that norm, you get you get punished for that. I. I I don't like that. I think the reason that masculinity is emphasized so highly is because there's like a such a clear and distinct separation from uh, between masculine and feminine traits. And I don't know, it, it's it's obviously like a huge thing and it won't happen in 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 or it won't happen like immediately, obviously. But I, I really like I really want to do something where uh, all these traits are just human and not boyish or girly or whatever i think how i sort of can inter interpret it um but i think i guess probably it's it's very likely the case that like a majority of people see masculine and fe masculinity and femininity because i think i see it more so that's like conventional that's how it was in the past but um now i feel like we should have we have the capability to go past that and there's circles that will embrace us um now um, no matter what kind of, where are we, masculinity, femininity, um, and everything in between, I feel like all those different types of traits can be, will be embraced to a greater extent than they were in the past. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I, I think on that same token, I think, uh, I think there still is a big, like, portion of society that sees the ideas of masculinity and femininity and uses that to say, oh, this is a definition of, what this person of this specific gender should be. Huh. I don't know. Um, I guess hmm. I was thinking, okay, this is kind of going to be transitioning to a, into another question, but I was kind of thinking about how you were saying like, you know, um, I guess masculine traits are kind of like valued more so than feminine traits. And I don't know. I th I feel like, that kind of got me thinking to about like our capitalistic society, because I mean, I mean the whole thing with that and the whole thing with capitalism is that you have to be, you have to beat out all your competitors. You have to, you know, make the most money. You have to make the most money out of everything. 
uh, out of everyone else and beat everybody else out of the water. And it just makes me wonder, you know, what other, I guess, of our institutions are, are kind of built on, I guess, you know, being masculine, being strong. And this is going to be kind of a weird segue, but, you know, <laughs> into the next question, which is, you know, toxic masculinity, or I just, shoot, I shouldn't say it, toxic patriarchy, I should say. You can call it toxic masculinity. I know what you're talking about. Okay, bet, 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 bet. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and like, I guess, I guess the system is, you know, so big. It's so big. And, you know, if we, if we try to step out of it, you know, we are going to be in a way kind of like, I don't know, we're going to be differentiated, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, we're going to be perceived as weak. So how, how do we solve this issue that's so big? And, 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 you know, by fighting against it, we're, we're stepping outside of the, the, the lines of what's normal. And we're, I don't know, we're perceived as, you know, I guess, you know, lesser almost in a way. Well, I think that, you know, just like I said, by having these conversations, you are doing amazing work, I think, because it's like, you know, and, and the fact that you're doing it together, right? So one of the things that Michael Kimmel, who's a sociologist who's been studying gender for, you know, decades, says, you know, it's very hard to do it alone, to be the, the one person challenging, you know, what feels like everybody else is on board with. So don't do it alone, you do it together. Right. And so solidarity, you know, that for, that applies to other movements as well. And then um, but also um, if I could just back up just a little bit, because I really loved Hajime's point about like not wanting to separate things into masculine and femininity. I mean, I think this is underway because you have people openly challenging the gender binary already. I mean, people are saying it doesn't work. It's so limited. It doesn't represent most people's experiences. And it forces these dichotomies that aren't just aren't even, you know, how people are. Right. It, it forces us to cut ourselves off so that, we, you know, all of a sudden you have to choose between thinking and feeling because thinking is masculine and feeling is feminine. When, of course, all humans think and feel right or, or like logic versus intuition I mean wouldn't you want to draw from every possible resource and strength that you have as you move forward so that you can make more informed decisions about how you want to be and what you want to do and so yeah I mean definitely there's I, I'm very inspired and hopeful but you know because of your generation because you're at this point where you're saying yep we don't want that we don't want these things of years past that we that have been shown over and over again not to be a good thing not to be healthy and how do we um but you're right it does feel big because it feels like you know if it's a cultural thing and it, it feels like a big heroic kind of task so most of the time, like, again, if we come back to like the motivation and people are just doing what works, right? And especially, you know, young people, but also older people, you know, we're doing what works. And when we find that people don't like what we're doing, that becomes a very strong motivation to stop doing that. So you were talking in the last episode about joking, right? So that's people testing the waters. They might say something. And if everybody just kind of laughs along, they'll be like, oh, okay, that was positive reinforcement, right? But if somebody makes a joke, like a sexist joke or a racist joke or a homophobic joke, and you say, you know what, that's really not funny, you know, they're going to stop because they want to, you know, if they want to be friends with you, they're going to, your opinion is going to carry some weight, right? And so that's one of the ways that you can do it in your daily lives. And if, especially if you do it without being like, you're a racist or you're, you know, in, not in a not harsh way, then you can kind of, you give them space to change their behavior without sh over shaming them because the shame is already, you know, so much a part of like, oh, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to be called out in a way that makes them feel embarrassed. So don't embarrass them if you can, you know, but kind of pull them aside and say, you know, that's not really cool, you know, and, and they hopefully will get, it. and also just, again, just even talking about it, like these jokes that you're making fun of, like if you use like the description of an entire group as an insult, you know, think about that, you humanize it, right? Like, do you know, you know this, is, this is an actual person, like what does that make it be, you know, how does that make a person who identifies with that group feel? And so kind of all those kinds of things that you can do in your daily interactions, that starts to shift the norms, right? Because the way that we bring about behavior change, there's a really, fantastic um, professor at Stanford um, in social psych named Lee Ross. And when I approached him about, you know, asking like, how do we bring about positive behavior change? How do we move people towards things we know to be more moral or more healthy? He says, well, people do social referencing, which you probably know from your social psych class as well. And he said, they, they, their reference group is people they perceive to be like them. 
And so again, you know, you are having an influence with all of your peers because they perceive you to be like them and they're going to want to match what you're putting out there as, hey, this is this is how we roll, right? Kind of deal. And like, this is how we roll. This is what we value. And this is what we aspire to. And I think that everything that you communicated in your podcast really shows you know, all the right, you're taking, you value all the right things. Like you were saying, you just want to make every, you know, increase acceptance of everyone so that people can just feel comfortable with who they are. And so that you can, you know, everyone can have better access to the things that are going to make us happy and healthy. I mean, I don't, I'd be hard pressed to find someone who disagrees with that goal, right? So they're going to want to be on board with what you're doing. And you, you know, and you're constantly, you are role models already, right? And so you're making these impressions, you know, if not, you know, be, not just within your peer group, but also anyone that's younger than you, or even maybe people who are older than you, they see like, hey, I like what these guys are doing. And they're going to, um, that's going to make an impression on them, even if they don't change their behaviors immediately, they're going to take that into consideration. It's going to influence what they do. I think, um, uh... Uh, a revelation or what I've been kind of noticing is that especially like I th I guess this is almost primarily in the realm of social media but there will be like groups of boys um, that will be perpetuating like I think the things that are like racist or sexist um, and uh, instead of getting like instead of people confronting them and them changing their ways it's almost like Toxic masculinity has reached like a, or toxicity, I guess in general, has kind of reached like a boiling point until where they're like saying like, yeah, these jokes are okay. Um, and I think, uh, I feel like I, I attribute a lot of that to, um, I feel like there's been movements in the past that like, like, um, that's not, they're not really movements at all, but it's more like just a notion that I guess exists solely in the realm of social media that like, or I, I feel like that's all I've seen expanded. Um, but um, that like con like I guess humor has been being like kind of like watered down, and so I feel like there's a lot of pressure from guys to kind of like um, push the on like like just kind of like push boundaries and stuff. Um, but I feel like it's to the point where they're completely obliterated, and I feel like um, I just think um, I feel like I don't know. I feel like what I've noticed is a lot of people. Um, like kind of under, I think a lot of people kind of coin the notion that Gen Z is one, like one united force trying to fight back. Or, but I think, I think uh, just that like that can kind of conglomerate of guys um, that I've seen, or like I don't know. It's it's like it's just like a I've seen a lot of like just pushback of like progressiveness and stuff. Um, what do you what do you guys think? Um, I'm not exactly sure. You guys, you guys. I, I feel like moving forward in this whole um, or pr progressive battle, if, if that's what you're talking about, is um, at least we we as men need to keep our our, our morals straight, and that that thing that we aspire to, as of right now, um, it does not include value the, the values of, of responsibility. Um, that, that it should and responsibility in itself um, being considered a feminine value and being excluded from uh, that that object of aspiration um, I, I think is, is really harmful um, to to the future of, of, of parenthood so um, for, for for this generation I think moving forward we need to have have that a more a moral set of values and keep those values straight mm -hmm. I, I that like i don't think that yeah answers your question no I mean, but actually um i don't necessarily know if this is what you were talking about but i think the the kind of the the i don't know do you guys feel like a lot of a lot of what you kind of like a lot of what you observe like schematically is a lot of that like exists in like the media or like social media and then when I, so what because when i kind of i kind of compare like what i was what i was saying uh before about like a conglomerate of boys, like uh, openly being kind of like racist and stuff on social media, um, and uh, like how that might have like how I think there's a little bit more divide than is kind of um, 
noticed. But I think under that same token, I think that's kind of, uh, I've observed that schematically, but it's to a much, much lesser extent in a group of Piedmont, like group of like Piedmont. Like there's nobody, there barely anybody has like said to our podcast or but like, I don't know, there's not been very many instances of people just like trying to be offensive on purpose for validation. But I think it's more so, especially the reception for our podcast. Um, a lot of it is like a lot of guys were appreciative that this platform exists in some capacity and that we were sparking these discussions. So um, I think I don't necessarily know if this is what you were trying to say, Jacob. But I think I think it is that sense of confrontation because we we weren't going to I don't think anybody at our school really would feel the like would feel capable of putting themselves out there and saying a bunch of offensive stuff. Um, but I think so. I, I think just when we're like. Um, synthesizing all our like when we've had this podcast and we've had other guests and stuff and we're just synthesizing. Um, it's just like we want to. It, the way that I guess that divide, I think, kind of the divide that kind of conglomerate group that I've kind of um, that I think that all kind of goes by the wayside, and it feels like first and foremost we don't care about like a lot of people don't ca- like care about perpetuating those kind of ideals, and more so just want to like showcase their own humility um, and just find connections. I think with this space. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, speaking of. Feedback to our podcast. I think Dr. Chu's time's running a little bit short, right? We got maybe 50 more minutes. Uh, we have some questions that our viewers actually submitted to us that they would like to ask you, Dr. Chu. Um, uh, one of the questions uh, asked was, uh, is there a possibility that one day gender norms no longer exist or are used, or is that too much of a stretch? Oh. Oh, I think I think and hope it's definitely a possibility. I think that again, people are really questioning the unnecessary constraints that gender roles pose. People are pushing against all of the, you know, again, just pushing against the, the idea that someone else is trying to tell them how they should be and what they should do. It's not to say that there aren't people out there doing that. And and to speak to Theo's point, I mean, definitely there is a problem. I mean, we we are emerging from, you know four years of very difficult, you know, kind of conventional ideas about how people should be, particularly in regards to gender. And so there's definitely, a, you know, I'm not saying it's an easy task. It is definitely not an easy task to go up against what feels like the dominant culture that still continues, even though, you know, a growing group is recognizing the harms of that. But to the, um, to the point of the, the question, yeah, definitely. I think that people are very... <sighs> They're fed up with it. They're tired of it. They've had enough. They say time's up, right? This is this. It's it's, and then and it, again, it's there's already decades of research that show all the different ways that this harms people of all genders, people of all races, people of various backgrounds. And so, um, I think uh, the struggle is worthwhile. And I think this, you know, and if we if, and if we um, Continue. I, I think that I, I just feel like even the fact that you're having this conversation again, I think is testament to the fact that things are changing. Because this, I even told my students today about this podcast, and I'm like, this gives me so much hope. It's so encouraging that young people now have access to enough information and and evidence to say to really um, substantially question the things that they used to accept kind of passively, or at least these gen- it didn't occur to them to, ch- to them to challenge it. So I think it's really a hopeful sign. And then we have one more question. I don't necessarily, uh, you know, if we can, probably, we, I don't think we can expand it too far, but uh, how, do, how does race, ethnicity, and sexuality kind of in your experiences um, just affect, um, just like talk, like, I guess, toxicity, toxic, like patriarchy? I think that um, that's a great question. I think we always want to look at intersectionality and how that, you know, how that impacts individuals' experiences. But when, you know, probably what I should have offered up in the beginning is a definition of patriarchy, just so that we were on the same page, because patriarchy really refers to a hierarchy where most men are, are valued over most women, but some men are valued over other men, right? So that that's where all the different, you know, so it's by gender, but it's also by race and by class and by, you know, by sexuality. And so, 
And those inequalities, the fact that we have differences in inequalities is what defines patriarchy and what runs counter to true democracy, which if, if we define true democracy as differences at, with equality, right? And so, and the one of the things to kind of move towards differences in equality is again, kind of what we, some of the themes that you, you mentioned is this idea of connection and really seeing people for who they are and respecting them. I mean, you don't, you know, making space for all of the differences instead of saying everybody has to be one way or even implying, and this is what makes, I think, mas the toxic masculinity problematic is that it implies that there is one right or best way to be. And so the more that we can challenge that and say, actually, there's a, there's a lot. In fact, there's this one campaign in Canada that says my masculinity is mine to define. If you if you want to adhere, because I think a lot of boys and men still are not quite willing, again, to the, the questioners, um, the question that came in, you know, a lot of people, boys and men are still unwilling to say, I don't care about establishing my masculinity or I don't care about establishing a masculine identity. But it, but that Canadian um, campaign really opens it up by saying, you're, if your masculinity is yours to define, then however you define it is valid and, can, and, and valuable, as opposed to saying, oh, somebody else is going to define it and then judge you to de you know, deem you worthy or not, depending on how you measure by their standards. And so moving away from being externally defined to being um, free to to be whatever you are. I mean, like our society as a whole benefits more when people bring whatever talents and strengths and qualities that are unique to them to the table, so to speak. So, I mean, but and on the note of like kind of fostering connections, we know that you know, our ability to be authentic and present with other people rests on our relationships. Again, so why it's great that, you know, the four of you have these conversations together. And then our relationships, the quality of our relationships depend on our presence, the ways in which we're able to bring ourselves. So the more that we're able to be authentic and self-accepting and accepting of others, the better it is all around. Mm. Oh, okay. All right, yeah. All right. Yeah, these are all really, Giant topics that we could we could talk for, um, for for a really long time to to very great extent. Mm -hmm. um, but I I feel like our, our time here has, has reached an end. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think on that note, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Doctor Shu. Um, yeah, I, I this was this was a yeah. I really liked hearing a lot of um just a lot about your research and your observations and I think just that ultimate point that you were like why is this kind of toxicity instilled um and you was like it's just because people want to just fit in and stuff I feel like just I think overall um I think just your observations and how they kind of root back to just the humility of everybody um I think uh that's a kind of an aspect of our podcast that we kind of want to embrace um and there's so much, I feel like there's so much, uh, there's so much want to be like formal. Um, but I really hope that going forward, we can just instill that sense of humility um, and, and embrace for one another. Yeah. Can I ask, have you seen the film, The Mask You Live In? We started it in social psych, but we didn't. We finish. did? We did. Yeah. 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 I think you like, might find that um, a, an interesting film and also a useful one just for generating discussion across like maybe people who aren't at the table here with you, you know, just to kind of um, consider some of the topics and things that you've been bringing up. I think one of the things I love best uh, going, going back to your initial question about, you know, um, feeling like you're the only one is that I, what I love about th that film is that the minute people watch it, they know they're not the only one. They know they're not alone because it, it displays various people talking about why toxic masculinity is a problem and what we can do about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, nice. All right. Well, yeah, we got to, because, yeah, last time, last podcast, we just, um, we had a short yeah movie discussion, too, about um, promising young women. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that could be an interesting segment in the future. Yeah. Um, I think it's awesome that it's all, like, even in the film industry, which has been, like, kind of kind of like looked at as like for corruption stuff but uh like i don't like there's just so many great films like kind of showcasing just like humility and like different things that we just don't talk about um and how this like what different people go through so yeah all right yeah before we wrap it up like i just want to say thank you so much dr Chi. Like, yeah literally thank you so much like you know you took the chance on like a group of just uh, juniors like right away instantly i send an email 
like and like and within like six hours you responded saying that you would you'd be happy to join us you know and i think it's i don't know i can't even describe you know how much you know that that has you know really encouraged us you know mm -hmm. and it encourages us to have these it encourages us to have these discussions and it really is i don't know beneficial when we have you know like good role models you know encouraging us to, you know to move forward you know with these kinds of things and i just want to say thank you so much yes thank you it's my pleasure and thank you again for having these discussions which i think are so important and very potentially impactful i've actually told other people about it and they've started following your instagram there's a woman who may be in touch she started a platform called men talk feminism oh, yeah, and yeah, I, I shared i shared her link with your your link with her because i'm like you need to check this out these boys are doing it and so um Hopefully she'll be in touch with you soon as well. And hopefully you'll get a lot, a lot of listeners, a lot, a lot of followers, because I think it's really good stuff you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And on that note, episode five commences. Um, so can we, should we do this with, I think, synthesizing what you were saying, Dr. Chu. Um, we, I guess, this, we, this um, all stem from just wanting to do an action project. Um, and fulfilling just like for all your like, grades and stuff. But I think um, just like that kind of outreach and how we've been celebrated um, and how I think in some, like in a, some capacity that um, a lot of people are enjoying or uh, just that we have a platform in general. Uh, I think we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep making more episodes. We're going to keep having guests on. And uh, I think um, uh, next year, 2021 and 2022, I think this, this podcast will be a staple of um, just media created by people in high school. So thank you guys for joining our, thank you guys for so much for watching our initial season of Trash Takes. Um, and I just, I just like, I'm so excited, so hopeful of where this is going to take us in the future. So uh, on that note, what a season, season one of Trash Takes commences. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Yeah. Thank yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. We'll see, you guys. see you in season yeah. two. We will see you guys in the next one. Season Bye -bye. two coming soon. See y'all. Trash Takes needs your feedback. If you want to voice your own opinion and have us discuss it in a later episode, click the Google form in the description below. Thank you.